Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Quaint Dwang. Uh, shall we? Shall we? Oh, uh, but first off, haha, we have a new Patreon supporter. Hey! So, I love those guys! Thank you very much to Fiona for signing up. Not just an awesome character in Shrek anymore, but also a prominent supporter of our podcast. See, this is really funny because I feel like in North America, most people think of Fiona Shrek Fiona Mm -hmm. because I guess it's maybe not such a common name there. But I don't know where you hail from, Fiona, Fiona Patreon. (laughs) That's that's your name now. I don't know where you hail from, but like on on this side of the pond, Fiona is an extremely common name. So I wouldn't generally tend to think of, of Fiona from Shrek. Um, who is an awesome character, I have to say. I, I, yeah. You know, she's cool. But um, but yeah, I, I thought, oh, like my lovely friend, rather than, oh, like yeah, the characters I've, from the movie. I've yeah. never met a Fiona in real life. Ah, that's so Ever. interesting. Yeah I, yeah, I know quite a few. It's a lovely name. I quite like the name. Yeah. But I just, I just don't. And I'm sure this particular Fiona is also quite awesome. But I don't know anyone mm-hmm. named that. So yeah. Apologies for being reductionistic, but Fiona's a pretty great character anyway, I think, so. Yeah, yeah, true story. You know. Yeah, but thank you, Fiona. <laughs> you're, you're awesome. You're awesome, and uh, all the other people who do that thing is, are, are awesome too. And we're they always really very, very grateful. It's fantastic. So patreon.com slash lexitecture if you're wondering what all the fuss is about. If you're but so inclined. It's about. <laughs> it's about Fiona and the rest of the awesomeness. Now, you had a word that you were very excited for, and I made you wait an entire week to tell me about it. Oh, it's, it's been a long time, and so, I've, I've been, I've kept it under my heart, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. Okay, as long as your excitement um, has not abated, why don't you take it away then? It absolutely has not abated, no. Uh, because, so part, part of my new job is to ask a lot of questions, because right now I don't know anything. <laughs> and I've been I've been thrust into this kind of industry and uh, body of knowledge that, that I really know very, very little about. So the, the learning curve is pretty steep. And fortunately, everybody is incredibly generous with their time and expertise. And when I do ask questions, I get nice, helpful, gracious people giving me full detailed answers. Oh, that's the best. So one one such occasion occurred last week where I had to go into the workshop. Now, you, you know me. I am the sort of person who would watch videos of mechanical processes over and over again for hours and hours and hours. And <laughs> I am a person who cannot get enough of online videos of people who are really skilled at a thing doing that thing. Yeah. Like the video of the traditional Chinese ink making process. Yeah. Oh my God. Just, yeah, just, just so delightful. And as soon as and, I saw that, I was like, Amy needs this in her life. Yeah. I, and I watched, so it was a long video. I watched the whole thing. Yeah. I could practically smell the animal fat. That was pretty disgusting. <laughs> but at the same time, like, like that, that video was wild. Yeah. Because like talk about niche. <laughs> It was just, yeah. it was all the niches in every possible way. Like, let's take a product that most people don't actually have any use for anymore. Or no and, exists. Yeah, and uh, within the category of people who do use this product, the number of people who are going to actually want to use this specific variety of the product is extremely small. Then let's further reduce the number of people who are going to actually buy our product by having the price reflect the ridiculous number of hours and amount of expertise that goes into making it. Yeah. And then let's make sure that we have to mature it for like 40 years so that it's, it's basically like diamonds. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much it, yeah. But but at the same time, there's the, the lovely, lovely man saying, well, we don't want to change how we make it because this is how it's always been done. 
and it's the best. And it works and it's the best, yeah. Yeah. Um, but going into the workshop, for me, is like squee wonderland, you know? That's, that's who yeah. I am. Big rooms full of machines that do things that I don't really understand, plus the smell of, of timber, plus... Mm people who are nice and will chat to me about it. It's just, it's just, you can see why I like this situation so much. Oh, 100%, yeah. So I had to go into the workshop and I was I was a little bit apprehensive because I'm still new and I don't really know people too well yet. And and I found my, my lovely, lovely colleague who answered my question about timber cladding, which is what I was there to ask him about. And while he was giving me that very full, very patient explanation, I noticed that on his bench, there was a, a technical drawing of the building that he was working on. And, you know, it was it was like a standard three elevation drawing, the sort of thing that you learned about in school. Yeah. And on that piece of paper, several times was printed a word that I had never seen before. And a word which filled me with so much delight that I actually had to <laughs> stop my colleague and say, whoa, 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 what's that? <laughs> and that word is dwang. I'm sorry? Dwang. D W A N G. <laughs> right? I'm I'm already I'm already a, a Twitter. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my god, what is a yeah. dwang? Yeah. And why is it written on that piece of paper so many times? So he explained to me what a dwang was. Now I will tell you, I will give you that explanation in, in just a moment. However, okay. I should note that I, I, I stored this explanation away and was like, what an awesome new word. That is super cool. I need to look this up because it could... I, I actually... Now, this is how excited I was about it. I didn't immediately think, well, this has to be a podcast episode. I just thought, oh my God, I have to know more about this word. So, yeah. so I, I just did a quick Google and the first article that I found was, was on Wikipedia where suddenly things got way better when they were already about a word that's called dwang. Yeah. Because here is what Wikipedia says. It says, in construction, a nogging or nogging piece, brackets, <laughs> England and Australia, of course. dwang, brackets, Scotland, South Island, New Zealand, and lower slash central North Island, New Zealand, Blocking, brackets, North America. Noggin, brackets, Australia and Greater Auckland region of New Zealand. Or Nogs, brackets, New Zealand and Australia. Is a horizontal bracing piece used between wall studs or floor joists to give rigidity to the wall or floor frames of a building. <laughs> so not only is it an oh. awesome word... It is an awesome word with equally awesome regional variations, highly yeah. specific regional variations, uh, particularly in New Zealand. Like yeah. I, I, I saw in one of the dictionaries that I, I was looking at this word, it, it said uh, this word's used in New Zealand, but not in Otago. <laughs> and I'm like, Sorry, okay, <laughs> cool. Otago, <laughs> they go their own way. Presumably yeah. they use the wonderful noggin. Noggin. Or nogging. So it's either N-O-G-G-I-N -G -G or N-O-G-G-I-N-G. -G -G. I was quite disappointed that in North America you just use the term blocking because you yeah. could be saying dwang or noggin. And you're not. Yeah. That is such a missed opportunity. Man, what a now, waste. It's such a waste. So uh, my, my colleague, Chris, he, I, I had I'd looked at this diagram of... of uh, I forget what kind of timber building it was. It was some sort of timber building. And and I said, oh, what, what's what's a dwang? And he said, oh, it's it's like a little piece of wood that you use for support. Like you, you can put them at the bottom of a frame uh, to like create a little gap to then support the thing that's going to go on top of that. He said, right. if you were putting up a shelf, you might add a dwang between the framing to support the shelf. Okay. Um, generally speaking, it's, it's a little bit of wood, a little strip of wood that we use, and, it, and it's to hold something up. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I, I left with a clear idea of, of what that was about and a wonderful new word. And this was before I discovered it was called noggin. So I then 
further interested, look, looked it up and discovered, oh, it, it, it just keeps getting better, this word. I, I just love it so much. Oh, man. First of all, I discovered that it is, it's included in the Dictionary of the Scots Language, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful website, dsl.ac.uk. Um, and so it, it, it fully qualifies as a Scots word, if you like. It's in a Scots dictionary. And what I discovered when I looked it up in the Scots dictionary really made me make excited, squealy noises. Okay. Here, is, here are the definitions given of the word dwang in this dictionary. First, we have... Number one, to compel, oppress, to harass, worry, to impose a strain on. I'm like, hmm. oh, well, that makes sense. So yeah. we have, for example, from 1808, one horse in a plough or one ox under the yoke is in this sense said to dwang another. And so this, this sense of... Hmm. You, you you can kind of like annoy somebody, harass somebody by dwanging them, but also a person can be dwanged um, b because they've got a, a strain being placed on them. You can also say dwanged over, which means to suppress. That dates from 1701. Okay. The, uh, to, to fix a dwang. And again, this is uh, it's defined here as the division stones and stall buyers to be five feet square and four and a half inches thick, drove the Arbroath pavement rounded on the angles, firmly dwanged with the feeding cribs. So it's to, to fix it in position. Right. And then we have the second sense, which means to toil or to work hard. Okay. Trash, hence for me, name mayor we you all dwang. I won't work hard with you anymore. Or a rather lovely one from 1900. An old schoolmaster on a hot summer's afternoon 25 years ago used to ask his pupils, what are you dwanging over your slates for? <laughs> so work, working hard. Yeah. We then have the nun, which means toil or labour, harassment or rough handling. And we've got it used in the phrase turn the dwang. Uh, to mark it out, my wheel got money dwang, um, and this this sense of of the sense of of work and or labour or toil. Right. We've then got rather lovely from eighteen twenty five, a large iron lever used by blacksmiths for screwing bolt nuts or a tap wrench, and this gives us the phrase turning the dwang or to turn the dwang. We also have dwang staff, a tool used for bending a plank to be laid on a boat for building. And then sense number three, we get to a transverse piece of wood or strut inserted between joists or posts to strengthen them. Uh, we have number four, a stout club or bar of wood used by carters for tightening ropes or chains. A lever of wood or iron fastened under the lower jaw of an unmanageable horse. I mean, we've all encountered those. So, well, yeah, you know, of course. Whatever will make that situation, situation easier, excuse me. Um, we have a stocking press or a lever or turn turn screw in a dyer's press and lastly lever power or a strain huh. and um, we it says so the Scots Dictionary is dwang a short transverse piece of timber from 1497 so a, an old word uh, to subject to pressure or compulsion or to harass or oppress is from 1583 um, we have the sense of, of compulsion or restraint and um as is the case with many, many Scots words, etymologically speaking, uh, hugely, clearly Germanic. And uh, it's it's always interesting to me when my main source of information about a word isn't the OED. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, given that it's a, a word that I'm, I'm looking at that's used regionally in Scotland, it makes sense that the Scots Dictionary has a bit more information about it. Um, the, the OED has that same 1497 um, citation, a short horizontal piece of timber inserted as a reinforcement between joists, struts and the like. It doesn't have any of the other senses, just, hmm. uh, just, just that single one. And we have, uh, we have citations from 1497 up to 1972. Now, the OED notes that the etymology of the word, it says compare Dutch dwang, which means force, compulsion or constraint from the verb dwingen to force. 
Now, I have no idea okay. how to pronounce Dutch words. We've we've talked about this before, yeah. but um, it, it seems seems like a, a fairly kind of. I, I hope I'm guessing well when I say Duang, and in fact, Wicked. Uh, no, the other one, Wiktionary, had this word right. too. And what they had to say about the etymology is that it's borrowed from Dutch Duang, from Middle Dutch Duank. And it also added that this is from Old Dutch Thwang, with a T-H at the beginning, from yeah. Proto-West Germanic Thwangi, or Thwanges. And so I started to get a little bit excited when I saw that there were pro you know, proto-languages uh, being involved in, in the etymology. I wondered if we might have some pie going on. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to look in and I discovered several interesting things. While I was looking for um, the Proto-Indo-European route, I found uh, very, very lovely Hagger Talks. Nice. Paul Anthony Jones had, in fact, mentioned the word Duang in a tweet, purely because it, it's it's a lovely word. And well, yeah. it's about to get lovelier because... In the Etymological Dictionary of the Scottish Language, which is a hefty volume published okay. by, uh, authored by John Jameson and available, I think, in its entirety online because the internet is awesome. Yeah. And uh, Jameson has this to say about the word. So we have the verb to duang, which means to oppress by too much labour. In other words, to, to give someone more than they can deal with. Right. And then the second sense is to bear a burden or draw unequally. And it again uses that, that uh, quotation that was given in the, the Scots Dictionary. One horse in a plough or one ox under the yoke is in this sense said to dwang another. That's more burden than one horse or one oxen should take. And I thought this was really lovely because, of course, if you affix a strut between your two joists to hold up another piece of framing or a shelf, then what is that piece of wood doing? It's bearing a burden. Mm -hmm. The yeah, burden, sure. in the earlier senses of the word, is a, a metaphorical burden. It's, it's hard work or it's uh, oppression or it's you know something something that is heavy to bear but i found it really interesting that the the sense of bearing weight is metaphorical first mm. usually that happens the other way around or quite often that's that's what we see jameson also notes sense three to harass by ill humor I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I've never done that to another human being ever in the no, world. No, of course. N just of course never. not. Yeah. We For have, shame. We have, uh, <laughs> we have senses like to force or to constrain. Um, we have uh, to dwang, another, another verb form, uh, to throw something. A rough shake or a throw, Jameson notes. And um, it, it, it's just, it's very interesting to me that this kind of sense of heaviness, throwing, labour, bearing weight, all gets wrapped up in, in this, this single word. So, Haggard Hawks and the Etymological Dictionary and the, the Wiktionary entry led me to think about, well, maybe there's a pie route behind this. So, of course, I took myself off to... <laughs> The University of Texas at Austin Linguistics Research Centre Indo-European Lexicon of Pi Etymon and IE Reflexes. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, dudes. Seriously, get an acronym. I Come love on. it every time. Every single time. Um, <laughs> they, um, they weren't all that helpful, which is a shame. Normally, they're very, very helpful. But yeah. I did have a bit more luck looking at the, the Heritage Dictionary. And it mentioned the word, it mentioned, oh, excuse me, I've lost my place. It mentioned the the Dutch dwank or dwang uh, somewhere along the line. I think I've forgotten where my note is for that. But dwang got mentioned in, in relation to another, another pie route. And the pie route was twang. That's T-W-E-N-G-H. Hmm. And now, of course, 
Etim Online very often has entries for pirates. So I headed over there to see if I could find Twing and I didn't find it, but I did find entries related to this, this word. The first of which is thong, which is one of these words that makes people from some countries giggle and other countries look confused about why those other people are giggling. Right, yeah, yeah. Because while, it, it, you know, this, this, the earliest sense of the word thong is a, a narrow strip of leather that's used as a, a band or a tie or, you know, s something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, but also in the UK, it's a type of pants and it's yeah. a type of pants where a string goes up your bum and that's a little bit funny. Yeah. Um, but then in Australia, thongs are flip-flops. Yeah. So it's it's great delight when somebody says, have you got your thongs? We're going to the beach. Ha ha ha. Chortle. Especially when those people are older relatives and you're a oh, yeah. you know, sixth grade student visiting said older relatives for the first time and then there's your like great aunt asking if you've brought your thongs to go to the beach. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm and in a new place now. I don't know what's happening and I'm very uncomfortable. So yeah. related to the entry for thong, which is a cognate of the pirate twing, which is the meaning here is given as to press in on or to restrain, which, okay. which makes perfect sense if you're thinking about a thong, tying something with a thong. Um, we right. also have the word twinge from the same root, a pinch oh, or a nipping. Oh, of course. Nipping as in to, to tweak same, yeah. same sort of thing so from pie twing to pass in to, to press in on excuse me it's also got the entry for the word wang neat from dwang to wang how wonderful <laughs> uh, etym online list this is penis 1933 slang probably from wang doodle an earlier term for a gadget or a thing for which the correct name is not known now that's a whole podcast <laughs> in itself yeah the the doofer the dubriator the thingy the what's it what you call wang doodle <laughs> yeah um however another possibility is that the slang word is a variant of wang meaning large thick slice which dates from the 1630s and that was <laughs> that was earlier used in the sense of thong and is itself a variant of thwang, an, early, an alternative form of thong. So the word wang may be cognate with the word thong, both of which may be cognate with the word dwang. Oh, man. So I, I took myself off to do a bit more research into the, the pirate okay. because I couldn't find it in the... <sighs> University of Texas at Austin Linguistics Research Center and the European Lexicon of Pi Etymon and IE Reflexes. <laughs> uh, but you know that pirates are pirates are often hard to find. Uh, there are variations yes. in spelling. There are lists that are more complete than others. There, theirs is based on uh, Pocorny's uh, list of, of pirates. And um, even within, you know, I looked at another Pocorny resource and found interestingly, a route that isn't listed in the University of Texas Austin's list. And it is twing, T-U-E-N-G-H, is how they render it here in an etymological dictionary of the Proto-Indo-European language. And the English meaning is given as to oppress. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It says... Da, 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 da. Press, press, and probably also press, beset, scold, tried. Sorry, chide, go okay. back, or belong to. And then once I managed to find T-U-E-N-G-H, I actually went back to the University of Texas Austin Linguistics Research Center into European Lexicon of Pietamon and IE Reflexes, <laughs> and I managed to find it there after all. So sometimes I'm just not very good at looking, I think is, is the lesson there. Um, they define it as to twinge, oppress, constrain, or close in. And gives us the list of cognates. We have Old English twingan, to twinge. We have thwang or thwong, thong, which mm -hmm. then gives us thong in, in Middle English and in, in Standard English. It gives us twinge, as in to pinch or to tweak or the idea of like my back I have a twinge in my back like a, a pain and 
in Old High German, we get the word Dwang, which in Old High German meant thong, bridle or harness. But that thing that was being oppressed was bearing weight. And eventually, in a workshop just outside uh, Dundee, it was the definition of a word meaning a piece of wood that holds up a shelf or a timber frame or anything else that needs to be held up by a little bit of timber. Oh, man. Dwang. Dwang. That's so cool. That was that's got, quite a journey. I I just I, like so much joy. Yeah. Researching this word, learning more about it. No kidding. Wow. Um yeah, there was a lot for me as an 11-year-old stuck in the body of an allegedly grown human to not <laughs> giggle at there. <laughs> Ryan, since when do we not giggle? Okay, fine. It's hilarious that there's a word in Middle Dutch called dwank. <laughs> <laughs> which means that the people responsible for putting the wood pieces under pressure to maintain the stru structure and rigidity of the walls were called dwankers. Oh, did not think about that. I, I mean, dwangers, did. I'd probably give it a g rather than a k. But I mean, the, the, the joke's not as good if you do that, is it? <laughs> no, I'm willing to sacrifice accuracy for humor. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, Dwang and Wang being yeah. potentially cognate, it's, it's, it's great. It's Just all great. of that. At every turn, there was a new great thing around the corner. I don't know what it is about, about that particular combination of sounds too, but just ang words are, are just yeah. very satisfying. Very pleasing. And, it's, and you don't think... get very many words with DW at the start either. No. There is a, a truly lovely Scots word. That's usually translated as meaning dream. Although okay. it, it can also be used as like a sort of a, a dreamy kind of zoned out state where you might say, oh, I'm in a dwam. Oh, okay. D-W-A-M. And I, I like dwam a lot. Yeah, um, that is cool. Yeah. But but again, I, th I think that the it's something to do with the the D-W. You, you know, you, you don't you, you don't hear that anymore. The, it's uh, also the, the shocking list. to me that it's not onomatopoeic. Like, yeah, yeah, that, I know it what you mean. is a noise. Dwang. That, that's a noise. <laughs> Why doesn't the noise factor into this? And, and I'm it sitting sounds here going, like it should go. Dwang, ang, 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 yes, it definitely. There's a reverb on it. It's. <laughs> it yeah, like, and in my head I'm like, okay, so I'm just already folk etymolog etymologizing, so that I can have an onomatopoeic reference. So like. I'm thinking here, I'm like, well, if wood or something is under a lot of pressure and it gets released, it would make a dwang sound. So maybe that's how it fits in. It's like, I no, mean, stupid, it doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with the noise. You've made up the noise. You've made up all of these connections, but I don't care. So many Germanic words just have <clears throat> wonderful sounding, could be automatic, well, yeah. but aren't sort of natures. Fair yeah. enough. But yeah, That's very dwang. cool. Dwang. Love it. I can't believe we're stuck with blocking here in North America. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, dude, blocking sucks. Come on. Uh, get awful. with the program. Yeah, we should get with the program. <laughs> um, I also like what that does for our episode title today because I'm, I'm very excited about um, the word that I arrived at as well. And my word for this week is quaint. Ooh. So we can have a quaint dwang. <laughs> Now, is, talk about words that are just delicious to say. Yes. I feel like W's make words better, yeah. just in general, like the W sound. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I was, cool. I, the, the long pause was because I was genuinely thinking, why is quaint such a lovely word to say? But but it really is. Mm-hmm. I'm a Continue. big fan. So uh, just, you know, I think it's a relatively common word. My... You know, if I was to uh, put on my lexicographer pants, and I have lexicographer pants. I hope they're clean. Or I should. Always. I um, don't know. I, I kind of feel like lexicographer pants might have, like, just, just a couple of stains <laughs> down the front, like, so most of the time. You know, like, you, you do Fair wash enough. them, and you know you're going to and you mean to, but then you put them on and you're like, God, what is that? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm doing the other lexicographers a, a, a disservice. <laughs> you know what? Lexicographers writing angry letters at you because they know all of the words. Yeah, they do. Oh, God. They can put them all in their strongly worded letter. Don't be pissing off the lexicographers. No, ever. Have you seen the burns that Susie Dent deals out on Twitter? Oh, man. Seriously, lexicographer and dictionary Twitter is a hilariously brutal place to be a lot of the time. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, but yeah, so if I had to define quaint, the way I sort of think of it is it's um, out, something out of step somehow, but usually adorably so. Like, and I don't think of it as being like, hmm. I don't think of it as being inherently pejorative at all, but it's close and doesn't take a huge amount of effort to make it that way. Yeah. Like you don't have to put a lot of stank on it if you call something or someone quaint for it to be clear that you're not impressed with it. Yeah. But you yeah, do I, have to put some stank on it. There, yeah. Context is, is very important in this particular case. I, I, I agree. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. It, re it reminds me of nice in that way. <laughs> like it's you know there's nothing inherently negative about it but you could you could make it that way if you don't you know yeah. if you're not careful <laughs> um <laughs> or indeed if you're very careful or if you're careful to do it yeah so it's about 800 years old in english the earliest citation in the oed is around 1225 ish that's old and this was one of these uh so sidebar alert klaxons and sirens and flashing lights wee, 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 now wee, wee. But you know how every now and then, like, it was a weird phenomenon while I was researching this because I find this happens sometimes where you just suddenly get a, a very clear window into a whole realm about which you know nothing, but that's immediately obvious that there's a million things to know about in that field. I, uh, I love that really hard. <laughs> like you just kind of get a kind of like um that thing in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy the the uh infinite perspective machine <laughs> that you go in and just gives you an immediate sense of exactly how small and irrelevant you are in the universe yeah. unless you're Zaphod Beeblebrox in which case the machine just kind of goes hey you're all right but <laughs> this weirdly this was one of these moments I had one of these moments looking this up because you know in the OED online you can click on most of the citations and it'll tell you more about the the book that it comes from or the yeah, work sure. that it comes from. So I clicked on the 1225 citation for quaint and it's a, from a book called the Ancren Riul, A-N-C-R-E-N-E-R-I-W-L-E. -E. Okay. And there's that awesome W. Yeah. Now that's a weird pair of words. So Very I much went, so. Yeah, so I clicked on the button and then I went, what? So I Googled it. And it turns out, uh, once again, Life in the Future is awesome because I was then able to find a site that contained like commentary on the full text of in Middle English and a modern English translation of this book from 1225. And Crane Rule. So I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes and on the site and stuff, and I'll put one out on, on the social meds. But here's the opening paragraph of that site about the book itself. And this is where I really kind of just went, man, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. <laughs> so I mean, th this is my base state of, of being these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what it says about this book, the rule for anchoresses, which is how it's translated, was composed between 1225 and 1240 by a religious man who was brought up in the old West Saxon kingdom in West or South Worcestershire in the West Midlands of England. It was written in Middle English for the spiritual instruction of three young women, sisters, well-born, but with restricted educational Anchises. opportunities. Sorry, right? I've just realized I've heard this word before. Got you. Keep okay. going. Sorry, very uh, interrupting. <laughs> well-born, but with the restricted educational opportunities compared to men. And it was composed in a region which valued English literary culture. We know this as a language does not show as, or sorry, we know this as the language does not show late West Saxon features or verb endings of more northerly dialects. It cannot come from an, the Eastern Midlands because of the distinctive way it spells Old English, the Y and the E-O diphthong, 
uh, it is a unique record, not only of an anchorite's way of life, but also of medieval Christian spirituality. The author was possibly a Dominican friar. The order was founded in 1216 and reached this area around 1230, considering the practices put forward in the document. Although E.J. Dobson speculated that the author might have been Brian of Lingen based on an anagram, who was thought to have been an Augustinian canon of Wigmore Abbey, who might have been the brother of the original three readers. This is unproven. Now, that is a lot of words. Wow. And I'm glad we all made it through that together. But that's a lot of words about a lot of things that a lot of people could have written a lot of PhD dissertations about which I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's just... I, I, uh... Did did this anyway. ever happen to you? Did this ever happen to you in university, where you'd be like, okay, this week I have to read this book, and you'd pick it up, and the first paragraph would be like that, and you'd you basically, with every <laughs> word you read, you'd be like, fuck, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I'd have to go back to school for another thirty years to be able to properly, really, even understand what I just read to you. <laughs> but at the same time. So much of it is super cool that I want to know more. Well, that's, yes, that's exactly it. Like, yeah. So anyway, the, this was one of these moments for me for sure. I found, and I also, because the internet is awesome and contains many wonders, I found a YouTube video dedicated to this book. It's oh, about 40 minutes man. long. I haven't read, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm gonna. I love that so much. And it's like, it's like when you have like a really, really obscure, like, tech support question and you google it and you find the answer on some like long forgotten forum site from like four years ago on the fifth nothing, page of google nothing is more satisfying like this somebody put this video up it's got like 400 views it was put up like six years ago but it's exactly the thing i was like what i really wanted to know was how do i pronounce this title and i found a 40 minute youtube version youtube video explaining everything to do with this 13th century book <laughs> See, see, this is it, right? Like, re remember when I joined Reddit and then told you yeah. how delightful Reddit was and it was so lovely and friendly and helpful and just everyone seemed so nice and you yeah. laughed for about a week. Well, yeah. And, and then you were like, <laughs> please, please just do whatever you've been doing and keep doing that and don't do anything different because right now you have a really lovely view of what this is. It may not be accurate, but it's lovely. So just you hang on to that, Amy. And I was like, okay, cool. Because, you know... Generally speaking, these days, people tend to think that the internet is terrible and it's full of, like, awful shit and horrendous people doing and talking about all sorts of terrible, crazy things and yeah. that, you know, it's it's degrading our culture and it's making people stupider and all that sort of, you know, all that chat. But then at the same time, it's also the tool that allows us to find 40-minute YouTube videos about a book from <laughs> yeah. the, the 13th century that was written for the religious instruction of three women <laughs> in yeah. a very specific region of England. Like, like that's yeah. just, that's amazing. Yeah. This is a book about which, like, maybe 12 people in the world know everything and yeah. nobody else knows anything. Knows anything. <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> This is about a book about which you have either expert level knowledge or utter ignorance about. And there is no in between, I think. I love it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, anyway, so <laughs> that's, that's sidebar over. But yes, when it comes to, I mean, Twitter's like that too for me because everyone's like, oh, what a cesspool Twitter is. I was like, I don't know. I know awesome people on Twitter and learn cool things every day on there. So it's rad. It just depends. Like basically don't go off the path into the woods don't is the rule the for the internet. The yeah, very much so. Choose your path. <laughs> make sure it's your path, the right path. And yeah. if anybody weird steps onto your path, get the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> and just let them go on their way. But do not follow them. No. Definitely don't talk to them. Yeah. Just If they, if they talk to you, just ignore them. Move on. <laughs> a casual nod while you maintain a steady pace down your path. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe have so... your keys in your hand just in case. <laughs> Maybe. That's all I'm Maybe. saying. Yeah roll up the newspaper or whatever um anyway, anyway so yeah uh back to this word in the earliest instance of this word this 1225 ancrin use the sense of quaint was quote of a person cunning crafty given to scheming or plotting which Ooh. is different from today's quaint very um now there's a couple other sort of 
contemporary senses, and again, we've talked about the murkiness of trying to say that any one was before the other, because all of these are within a 25-year span as far as when the original source oh, wow. was. So that was 1225. In 1230, it could be it was used in the sense of, of an action scheme, device, etc., characterized or marked by cleverness, ingenuity, or cunning. So that's an obvious, like, you know, a yeah. person is crafty, a thing was done craftily by a crafty person. Yeah, sure. There's another one from so this one was interesting. Uh the citation is from 1250. The OED has a little note and it says the document is from 1250, but the composition of the text is likely around 1200. Ooh, so okay. even when we have the dating of these written examples, mm. it, it's, you know, it's like, well, this one was dated 1250, but maybe there's an indication that it was a copy of a work from 1200, but they're still dating it by the date of the actual manuscript. So sure. the dating of this stuff is very hard, but that was basically just... Uh, clever, ingenious, wise, knowing, or skilled. And then a, a bit off the book is there's 12, a 1225 citation that says proud, haughty, or vain, which it, it's not miles away mm. if you think of it as someone like to someone who is not <laughs> clever, ingenious, or cunning, the affectation of a person who is generally regarded as clever and genius or cunning can often bleed into pride, haughtiness, and vanity. Absolutely. So yeah. that there's a way that I, I can see a path between those two things. Like that, yeah, that doesn't definitely it's not light years away. In the early 1300s, uh, it's by the early 1300s, it's taken on a meaning of skillfully made to be attractive, cunningly or ingeniously designed, uh, or gracious, courteous, courtly, and refined, and that depends on whether you're talking to a thing about a thing or about a person, or same type of differentiations as the original one. Cool. Uh, by 1325, we get a bit of an unusual sense of strange, unusual, unfamiliar, curious, remarkable, mysterious, and in some instances, it has got like definitely a supernatural or magical tinge to it, mm. which I guess is similar to. Like Asimov's, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic thing. <laughs> yeah, like if sure. something is something can be so ingeniously made that you're like, well, I, I it makes me feel funny things, and I don't know if I like being around it. I but, I thought that was Arthur C. <clears throat> Clarke, but I don't, oh, you know what? I don't know. That's entirely possible. I may be missing mixing up my sci-fi giants. Sci-fi giants know. are. Uh, I mean, they're prone to saying excellent things. Um, yeah, just in general. Yeah, continue. Sorry, I, I, I might I might be completely wrong. I don't know. No, that's fair. Either way, someone was yelling that. Yes. So either they're right or not, and I'm right or not, and I, one of us has learned a thing today. So, <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that what it's all about after all? One of us has learned a thing today. I love it. Yeah. By the end of the 1300s, we get uh, Chaucer riding up gracefully to describe speech and language as being quaint, which means uh, carefully or ingeniously elaborated, highly elegant or refined, clever slash smart. Um, and dude, I mm -hmm. I don't quite know how to do this, but I, like I, I don't I don't want to steal your thunder, but okay. you're probably about to talk about this. But I have to point out that I know what the word quaint means when Chaucer uses it because I know the context in which he uses it, mm -hmm. and it, it does not mean that word does not mean what you think it means. Do you tell? Are you? Are, maybe, maybe you're not about no, to no, talk, go on. talk about this. There's a usage of uh, there's a usage of the word quaint. It's spelled Q U E N T in the Miller's Tale. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Go on. Now I, I should point out that all the while that you've been talking about the various different definitions for this word, mm -hmm. I have been inwardly chortling about the fact that actually. All of these definitions could be applied to the thing that I'm about to talk about, depending <laughs> on your kind of socio-political attitude to women. Right. <laughs> because the the usage in Chaucer in the Miller's Tale 
Um, the Miller's Tale is a, a highly sophisticated, hugely scholarly... Th this is what I thought Chaucer was what, before, I, before I read any. Before, I read before any you actually opened a book, yeah. Um, yeah. It's a story about a, 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 an old man with a young wife. Ha ha, hilarious! <laughs> who, who is cuckolded. <laughs> and at one point, someone kisses an arse. And farting in faces happens. Yep. But uh, the, the word quaint used in Chaucer is believed to be the etymological ancestor of the word cunt. Yes. So if you were thinking you might get away without putting a strong language sticker on this episode, <laughs> Amy's ruined that plan again. Welcome to this show. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure yeah. eventually, eventually we're going to do our, our, our epic vulgarity show. Yeah. Where we hand, where we tackle the two big ones, but not today. Also, it's funny that you're you're absolutely right, as we've talked about before. That Chaucer has this, um, there's this this expectation of Chaucer for people who haven't actually read any as being stuffy and yeah, I mean similar to to, to Shakespeare, like being yeah, yeah, sure, stuffy and erudite and very prim and proper and stuff. But I mean, when when you say <laughs> In the Miller's Tale, there's ass, kiss, ass kissing involved. That that does not do justice to what happens in the book, like it, in the it, Miller's it really Tale. Doesn't. It doesn't. Like the it's yeah. The fact it does the not fact do that justice. Someone actually kisses an arse is probably the least sort of ridiculously comedic thing that happens within the Miller's Tale. Yeah, it's it's just it's. It's a slapstick, ridiculous it's, yeah. humor of a twelve-year-old. It's 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 great. I mean, it's absolutely. I, I I was so nervous about having to read Chaucer, and it, partly because I was nervous about everything at university, and I thought everyone was cleverer than me always, and right. also because within the English school system, Chaucer's quite often studied at A level, which like we don't do A levels here in Scotland. We do a different set of exams. So I was basically right. like, well, everyone's going to have done this before. And I'm probably not going to understand it because it's very scholarly and hard. And then I realized yeah. it was basically carry on films circa medieval. Yeah. It's like if, if the dudes from Monty Python had the, their fully developed brains, but the rest of them was even more like a 12 year old and nobody was stopping them from writing anything that came into their heads. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Chaucer. So, um, <laughs> Now, it, but it, yeah, this one it was it wasn't the the citation of the OED for quaint in this case wasn't the Miller's Tale. It was shoot, I didn't write down which one it was, but it wasn't it wasn't that one. Okay. So in this one, it actually was this carefully and geniusly like blah blah blah. But because there was a yeah, but fair enough, fair point. Um, yeah, I mean, I just I just kept thinking like you know. I know yeah. that the, I know that, that that cunt is used very differently in North America and in and in particularly in Scotland. I think we've probably talked about this before. <laughs> um, it's almost a term of endearment here. Um, Scotland usually, and Australia have a very different relationship to that word from the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it is also absolutely used here as a highly pejorative, deeply offensive usually derogatory term like addressed to a woman like it, it also yeah. has that shade it also has that gloss but it doesn't always mean that here and i think i think in in the u.s then that that does tend to be the case when when people yeah like particularly if you call someone a cunt you are being deeply aggressively offensive towards them yeah and uh, and and yeah like i say in, in scotland and it, like you say in australia it's 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 just not it can be used like that, but there's also different shades of meaning um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Context, context is everything, yeah. Contextual usage definitely yeah. has to come into play. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's you know, if, if, you, if you want to substitute the word cunt for women, then I do find it really quite interesting that variously over the centuries... That the word quaint has meant um, smart, beautiful, uh, sophisticated, and it's meant tricksy and cunning mm -hmm. and untrustworthy, and it's meant uh, haughty and <laughs> you know it's, it's yeah, yeah. like I say it's it's very interesting. Um, 
I wish I knew more about. I wish I had a wee time machine for for a word like this. It would be very very yeah. interesting to to actually be able to answer some of these questions that are you know it's folk etymology tends to be hugely involved <laughs> when it comes to to swear words particularly. Oh yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I I find this one very very interesting. There's mm -hmm. there's also a theory. There's a, a theory about um, quaint the the Chaucerian use. That yeah. It may well be cognate with the county name in England of Kent mm. and Kent is it's the part at the bottom that kind of there's a I'll not dazzle you with jargon here there's a bit of land <laughs> that sticks out and then there's a kind of a corner shaped um, <laughs> coastline and th there, there is speculation that the, the notion of a, a joining together or a, or a kind of a corner point uh, is perhaps shades of meaning with both the quote unquote anatomical term and the county of Kent. But you know, folk etymology has always been fun for people as childish as us and perhaps more educated than us. So who knows? Yeah. But also there's a lot of spoilers here, so we gotta save some for the actual Sorry, eventual I, I, episode I, that we're gonna I just do. I, I I was I was too <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. I, I was I was just too well giggly. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Um, now, by the end of the 1400s, we get a sense of dainty, fastidious, and prim. Okay. And by the late 1700s, we arrive at the first written example that the OED has access to of the modern sense, which is sort of attractively or agreeably unusual in character or appearance, especially pleasingly old-fashioned. Yeah. So, which is interesting that quaint has meant pleasingly old-fashioned since the the late 1700s <laughs> so it's it's a very old word what did people consider quaint in the 1700s <laughs> just mud <laughs> lots of mud uh. yeah because like for for me that's the that's the first kind of shade of meaning of that word yeah it's it's old-fashioned and perhaps a little bit out of place rather yeah, than it being sure. beautiful or pleasing yeah yeah, and that's definitely the, the the modern use. Like from from then on, essentially, it, it that's what it meant. Oh, okay. So the um, sort of etymology wise, the word comes from the French side of the family. So we got Anglo Norman, uh, quaint, either K O I N T E C O I N T E C U E N T E or Q U E I N T E, from Middle French. Quaint, C-O-I-N-T-E, meaning clever, astute, quick-witted, experienced, or expert. And that's from the 11th century. And before that, uh, it comes from Latin. And the Latin word that it comes from is cognitus, meaning known, the past participle of cognoscere, to know. Nice. Well, exactly. Because that, that would not nice have meant been to not in my know. top million guesses. But the connection between nice and quaint, where nice originally meant nescio or nescire, yeah. and cognoscere, to know. So quaint was to know and nice was to not know. But now they sort of are kind of very similar words. Yeah. Even though originally they were literally exact opposites. That's amazing. But uh, yeah. So I decided to go to, I decided to look it up in uh, Smith, see what Smith had to say. Oh, Smith. And synonyms discriminated. And he says as follows. So quaint is from the old French quaint. Its primary meaning is artificially elegant or ingenious, then affectedly artificial, and finally odd, antique, yet retaining always an element of the pleasing. The idea of quaintness belongs at present most commonly to style of thought and verbal expression in which appears a combination of fancy, originality, delicacy, and force, yet a disharmony with present nodes. Present modes, sorry. Quaint architecture, for instance, is in detail antiquated and curious, showing an obsolete beauty and an unfashionable ingenuity. <laughs> I love Smith. Do you think Smith talked the way he wrote? Oh, I hope so. Oh, me too. <laughs> but Just... I like that. Uh, I mean, I like all of that, but it's it's another, it's sort of like, this is why I love old dictionaries because you get a much more a dictionaries were always written in a more entertaining way than they are now. I think. Yeah. Um, 
but also you you get in books like this where you actually look into the books where the citations come from you do get like this is that's a very clear so in the you know in, in the time of smith this is what this is what quaintness meant absolutely yeah. and he would you know if there was another one he would have said something so like, that's the, at least in his part of the world but yeah I, I also i just like that showing an obsolete beauty and an unfashionable ingenuity unfashionable ingenuity is just that's such a bafflingly beautiful pair of words yeah it really is <laughs> it's pretty great so yeah there's uh quaint how quaint, quaint? wang quaint dwang that's it's, i'm just so happy <laughs> it's, it's a very pleasing episode title <laughs> and that's it for another episode of lexitecture to get in touch with us about something you heard this episode you can email us at words at lexitecture.com you can also follow along and talk to us at lexitecture on facebook and twitter and at lexitecture podcast on instagram for back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon.